Good evening, everyone. Um, I know my colleagues mentioned that Bristol was the first for a number of things, but I also want to remind us that Bristol is also the city of sanctuary for those who are seeking asylum and refuge. So I think we should congratulate Bristol for a number of reasons. Uh, it's a great place. I just don't mind the rain. It just messes up my hair. <laughs> Um, I'm going to share the presentation with two of my colleagues, um, Carly Stokes and Professor Eric Herring. So I will say a few, few, few I'll take a few minutes and then I will, I will introduce them both uh, uh, one at a time. So a little bit about ourselves, uh, Transparency Solutions. Uh, it was in fact founded uh, a place just down the road uh, in Chippenham of all places. And in fact, uh, we've operated for a number of years here in Bristol. Uh, we now have a small office in the University of Bristol, but we are located and operate in Somalia and Somaliland. Um, so that's where our operations are, but we have strong roots in Bristol. Um, so I run uh, the company. Uh, we have roughly about uh, 40 staff and about 30 consultants. We're also fortunate to have a strategic partnership status with the University of Bristol, and that gives us access to a really clever people who we, can, we usually get them out from here in, in the cold and take them to the, to the sun in, 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 in Somalia and Somaliland. And we haven't seen anyone complaining yet. So, uh, so far, so good. Um, I, will, I will make a start. And what I will do is just to set the scene and, uh, about the politics of Somalia, because we were discussing this morning about any work you do, uh, you really, if you don't take politics into account, uh, you'll fail, and everything about Somalia is, is, is uh, governed uh, or managed around politics. But a little bit, uh, we, 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 we've been around almost 17 years, so it's, a, it's a, a almost two decades now. It's a, a new decade uh, we started. And, and uh, yeah, I, I think I already talked about this. I'll, 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 I'll quickly wish through this. Um, I know most of you know Somalia through the news. And it really is unfortunate. I know my colleague Michael was talking about um, Rwanda and how Rwanda now is rediscovering itself. And Somalia has a, unfortunately has a bad reputation of having, uh, whether you talk about warlords or uh, terrorism, pirates. Uh, usually I joke and say, when people, when people say to me, what do you do? And I say, what if I'm in, in Bristol? I'm a pirate in Somalia. I'm a, I'm a warlord. <laughs> uh, so the list goes on. But, uh, but we do have a reputation. But I, I can tell you, Somalis are great people. I think they're one of the most resilient societies in the world. And we have a great country. I know my colleague was talking about how small Rwanda is. And it's true, I have been there. It's a fairly small country. It's a massive country. Uh, to us, the size of the United Kingdom, uh, we have uh, probably the, the second longest coast in Africa. And, and now, um, as of last year, we're talking about lots of oil, which is, I hope it doesn't become a curse. Uh, uh, so we, we have the conflict of Somalia is very much perpetrated and, 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 and fueled by uh, outside forces because clearly there is a lot of oil both onshore and offshore, also gas and mineral is all of it untapped. Uh, so there is absolutely no reason why any Somali shouldn't be rich, but unfortunately we are, we are run by, uh, by idiots. Um, and and, and uh, we, we also must be idiots for allowing them to run us. Uh, then I can say the same about the UK and US. So. <laughs> yes, uh, need I mention any more names? I was talking to three American colleagues, and they said both of them are refugees now uh, <laughs> in the UK, and then Brexit hit, hit them. So, uh, yes. Actually, Somalia is now receiving refugees. So we have Syrians and Yemenis now, lots of them. And we love them because they have actually skills. We don't have like fixing my teeth and you know, <laughs> things like that. Um, so the state of the country, uh, Somalia is divided into seven states. So yes, there is, since the collapse of the state in 1991, there has not been a unified Somalia. So you have in the north where it says Somaliland, a secessionist state, uh, which roughly has a population of about 3 million. The capital city is Hergeza, is where we have our headquarters. It's followed by Punlan uh, towards the east, and again, capital Garoway, roughly similar population, but in terms of land mass, bigger, bigger than Somaliland. And if you combine those two, those two, in fact, com combined, has about 53% of the land mass that Somalia sits on, both of them relatively peaceful. So if you talk about conflict in Somalia, 
actually you could argue more than half of the country is peaceful and has been for, for some time. Um, followed by Galmudic state, uh, which is um, here, and sorry, I don't have the little torch, so I, I'll, and I'm not tall enough, so I'll chomp. Uh, <laughs> so followed by Galmudic state, and then Hirshabela state, uh, Southwest state, which is the capital here, Baidawa, and Tubaland, which is Kismayo. Now, this is the last uh, formed state, which is only about three and a half years old. The, the, it's a new federal system. We used to have a unitary government where uh, everything was run from Mogadishu, but now we have a federal system which uh, five states plus Mogadishu, which sits on a separate uh, area called Bia, uh, Mogadishu uh, regional state, uh, sits on. So apart from Somaliland, the rest forms the federal state. And in terms of education, all of them are at different stages, which my colleague um, Carly will talk about. But politically, it's fragmented in that sense, but it's only politically. In terms of tra trade and human-human human movement, uh, there is no barrier. Uh, people do move around. Um, oh, sorry. Um, it's fairly a young population. Uh, the medium uh, age is only 18, 18 years old. Uh, uh, it, this is what the UN is telling us. Our life expectancy is 52, so that means I don't have long to live. Uh, <laughs> uh, but then I had a cousin who died recently. He was 120 years old. Uh, uh, so uh, I, I, I think uh, you have to take this with a, with a bucket of salt, not a pinch of salt, but I guess. Uh, a population of about 15 million. But I, I say that again uh, with inverted commas because we've not done census for a long time in Somalia. Uh, it's something very sensitive in the, in the Somali sense, the reason being that um, uh, the country is divided into clans and regions, and every clan uh, thinks that my clan is bigger than my clan, my, his clan, and this has been hugely problematic. Uh, so I know you have a little bit in Kenya, those issues. I know the Somalis in Kenya are not happy about the last census, the most recent census, because they downplayed the number, as I'm told. I'm not Somali-Kenyan, so there, there will be no fight between the two of us. <laughs> Uh, but nevertheless, nevertheless, we think roughly the population of Somalia is about that, that, that much. But if you include Somalis who live in the Horn of Africa, in, in Ethiopia, in Kenya, Djibouti, of course, uh, then you're talking about the big population of roughly about, and of course, Kenya, uh, in the, in the north, north, northwestern front, northeastern frontier, is that correct? No, no, yes, exactly. So roughly you're talking about, about 30 million, a population of 30 million. And in fact, one of the... I know mean, you were talking about reforming your education. We are currently re revising or reviewing our constitution. And would you believe it? One of the hardest questions to answer is, what is Somali? Who is Somali? Uh, because a Somali from Kenya can come to Somalia and run for a, um, uh, for a um, yeah, thank you, uh, run for an office. So I will stop there about the politics and invite my colleague, uh, Carly, Carly Stokes, to talk about the uh, education. And then I'll introduce Eric. Sorry, my voice, I am losing it. I've got a sprained ankle, so we'll get through this together. But um, I'm just going to cover briefly sort of the stages of education in Somalia. So what a child would sort of move through, ideally, through the formal education system. Um, six to seven years old, a child would start primary education, um, sit through that for four years, move on to intermediate, and then to secondary school, where they would finish up at 18 years old. Um, from there, they can move on to higher education. There is um, colleges and universities in Somalia. In Hargeza alone, there are 30 universities. Um, 20 of those are located within the city limits. So um, there is higher education opportunities for students there. One thing that's sort of interesting, though, is that when if you were to go into a classroom in, Somal in um, Somalia across across uh, Somaliland, Puntland, um, you would find that the ages are quite variant. Um, they say that in the primary education, only 50% of the students are within the proper age range. So a lot of delayed enrollment, which means delayed enrollment in following um, stages of their education. Um, so there are a lot of challenges, but there are a lot of positive movements. Um, that are happening in education across Somalia at the moment. So I'll cover some of those. First, just some statistics. Um, these were broken down by the federal government of Somalia, um, by uh, Somaliland, Puntland, and South Central. South Central is that group of states that Latif covered 
um, that are sort of all below Poot Land. A lot of times these are um, collapsed into one when it comes to statistics and things. So as you can see, this is access to education. So this isn't enrollment. Enrollment numbers are a bit lower. But in Somaliland, only about 50% of children will have access to primary education. And that drops to 20, uh, just 21%. You can see in Puntland that number is a bit higher. In South Central, it's much lower. So um, this is sort of what a child growing up in Somalia would probably have access. This is the chances that they would have um, accesses to a formal education. So some other challenges um, besides um, having access, um, it's very difficult to attract qualified individuals to teach in schools. And a lot of that is because the educators in Somalia are paid extremely low salaries, um, and they're often overworked. So the uh, education system kind of becomes a, a place where many people take a first job as a teacher, and they plan on transitioning somewhere else after they've gotten a little bit of experience not in teaching. Um, so this has sort of meant that it's quite low quality instruction. Um, and in, in addition to that, there's often poor school infrastructure um, and especially for a disabled student, a student with a wheelchair, quite difficult to access a classroom. This is then made more difficult by the fact that a class size average would be 60 to 90 students. And these aren't rooms that are meant to house 60 or 90 students. Um, so other challenges, there's not, a real, there's not a standardized curriculum. And oftentimes, not even within the school will the curriculum be standardized. So, and then certainly not across different schools. Um, and then this was mentioned um, in another presentation, but language of, language of instruction is, is, super, um, is a super big challenge in Somalia. Um, some children grow up you know, learning Arabic or Somali, and then they transition to a school that speaks English or Arabic. There's different accents in Arabic, and they're learning different subjects in different languages. And that can be quite confusing for students. And when they're applying for jobs and trying to get into the workforce after they've gone through their schooling, that creates challenges for them thereafter. So some challenges that are often overlooked, um, I'll just go through these rather quickly. There's limited supervision when it comes to the oversight of teaching, and that includes materials but also includes supervision of the students themselves. So plagiarism sometimes isn't really even a, a, um, like a topic or something that a student would understand. So they wouldn't understand that copying and pasting something off the internet was necessarily a bad thing. Um, enrollment of children in madrasas where they attend after school, so they don't have time to do their homeworks. Um, large gaps of quality between private and public schools, which makes this sort of um, inequality gap in the, in the cities much larger, um, lack of clear educational policies from the government, um, as well as um, any national training um, for teachers, curriculum, or assessments of students. So these are some just some pictures. And these are real schools. This first one's up here is in Hargeza. And this one down here is in Mogadishu. It's a Turkish school. So these are staged photos. Obviously, everything's kind of cleaned up. But you can just see sort of the simple nature of the classroom. Um, if these weren't an exam, the, these classes would be much crowded, much more crowded. Um, but you can kind of just get an idea of what it looks like, peek into a classroom in Somalia. So the great thing is, is that um, there's already been a lot of positive movement um, within within Somalia. So um, a national examination board is now effective. And um, they're starting to crack down on the forgery of, of diplomas, and, and um, <coughs> which has meant that a, a diploma now means a little bit more. Because with all these forged diplomas around, um, it, it would take a while to understand if a person had really gone through an education. Um, centralized national examination has been established in South Central. Public schools in Somaliland are almost free of charge now. Um, salaries for educators appear to be increasing. Um, there's an increase of student enrollments in primary, secondary, and tertiary education. So although enrollment is low, it is increasing. Um, and then these technical centers for any externally 
funded projects, we're seeing small establishments of those. And then, of course, efforts to promote the access of public education are happening publicly. There are social media um, people sort of championing this on social media. So we are seeing some movement, and, and definitely there are people who are already sort of championing this change. And I would like to welcome uh, Professor Eric Herring, who is a friend of Somalia, Somaliland, and Somalis. Eric and I have been working together for a number of years. And in fact, uh, Eric used to be my teacher before we started working together, so I should be in my best behavior. Uh, <laughs> uh, Eric, uh, he's very much in, embedded in the community to the point where he earned himself a nickname called, called Eric, uh, Eric Abdi, or Abdi Eric, depending which, uh, which way he prefers. So uh, Professor Eric Abdi, uh, please take the floor. <laughs> I, so I will, I will be very brief, not take a, a lot of your time. Uh, what I want to just do is emphasize a couple of things that might not be that familiar. So Somalia is very much a place of joy and excitement uh, and happiness uh, and has really had a, a remarkable impact on, on my life. I went to Somalia and I saw the innovation and success. And so in terms of entry points and way forward, fundamentally what we're doing is we're building on Somali success. People like Carly and people like me now work for um, uh, Somalis. It's the Somalis that are delivering the development, and all we can do is come in and help a little, and they are the ones that are doing the, 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 the key work. So, for example, um, one of the key partners we have is uh, Hermut Telecom. If you said, I want to build world-class telecoms, let's do it in the middle of a civil war and the collapse of a state, you'd think they were insane, but that's exactly what they've done. Um, and they've built a university that's highly successful technical and vocational education. They have organized better uh, mobile phone coverage across the whole country um, than, uh, than we have in the UK. Um, and they have trained those people. Right? And so they are investing in uh, disability education, in education, in education for refugees, in rural education, education for marginalized communities. This man here decided to build a school. He raised $800,000, built a school that now has 750 students, gender balanced, his, his, they embody the values of positive education. The staff that he employs are from marginalized communities. They have a no food waste policy. Every single bit of food that gets um, uh, brought into the, the organization has a queue of families that are supported with that. He runs uh, scholarships. He has uh, rations for uh, Yemeni refugee families. It, I mean, it is absolutely extraordinary what they're achieving. It's an absolute privilege to be working on it with these Somali success stories and learning from them. Uh, and we have access at, at the federal government level and the government of Somaliland level, and the ministries of education are happy to work with us, and all the leading universities are fully on board. So in relation to what we want to do is we want to leave a legacy, and that legacy will be held by the Somalis themselves. And then the very last thing I want to say, and I think it's really sobering, is that the Somalis have so much to teach us. And what we have to learn and listen to from them is the fact that what they are achieving is being fundamentally put under threat by our overconsumption. It's shameful and worrying and frightening, the fact that all they are doing is being threatened by consumption not being done by them. And to see that being rolled back in my years of going back and forward, it's kind of horrifying. So I think that's a, a, what they have to teach us, that this is a global challenge. 